Okay, hello everyone. My name is Janne Salo, and I'm a senior developer at EXO. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about the cache control module and how you can use it to help you to build high performance sites on Drupal and how we have used it at EXO. So, what I'm going to talk to you first, I'm going to spend a couple of moments to talk about who we are as a company. And then I'm going to go into some details about the gas control module itself and how it works, things like this. And, well, I'm not going to go into too, mu too much details because there are some complexities, complexities involved with the module. And then I'm going to present you three cases we've used the module in. First one is really easy for, like, perfect use case for the module is this hockey site called theatkoaika.com. Then we have a hard case uh, community site for teenage girls, demi.fi, which has a lot of authenticated users generating a lot of content, and it really puts the servers on a strain. And then last, last case is, is a bit different one in that we didn't have to deal with by loads rather than geographical distribution. And after that, we'll have some Q&A. So, a few words about EXO. We believe in open source, which I guess everyone does here. And we come from the Northern Europe. Our headquarters is in, is in Helsinki, and we also have a presence in Estonia and the UK. And well, we were founded in 2006, and we're about 60 people now, most of, most of which are developers. We don't have that much uh, other staff. And since 2006, we've served more than 120 clients. And some of you might have met our CEO, Janne Kalleola, who is the uh, chair of business and strategy track here at DrupalCon. And this is really all, all I'm going to say about us for now. If you are interested in hearing more, you are welcome to visit at booth, booth number 38. So, what's cache control and how does it work? Uh, well, on this slide you can see the address to the project page. You're welcome to check out the code if you like. You'll probably, if you're technically ori orientated, you might want to take a look because I going to skip some details in this presentation. Okay. So, cache control is, on conceptual, conceptual level, it's really simple. It's, it's a module for integrating your site with Varnish or some other a external HTTP cache. And I'll be mostly talking about war Varnish today because it's the one we have most experience in, but uh, we also have some experience with the Nginx caching. It's pretty much the same, except that it doesn't uh, support purge requests, as far as I know. And, well, whenever I say varnish, you can replace it with your favorite external HTTP cache if you want. And, well, how it works is it's really just manipulates the cache control headers in the HTTP request that Drupal sends out. And some of you might already have guessed where the module's name comes from. And yeah, we also have sub support for purging content from the cache. And we do automatic purges when, for example, nodes update, uh, nodes get comments, things like this. And then we provide a hook system for those who want to upgrade some content on their own. But actually, I just, before, just before the launch, I went to see the session by the Columbia Law School where they presented their own, own way of doing cache purging, and I kind of like it. So that's cache tagging is, is, is a way I would like to see cache control going someday. And and then, cache control comes with an admin UI where you can select which menu router paths you want to cache. 
and you can also specify different TTLs, times to live for different parts. You, so you can have like content that expires fast and some content that just hangs in there until purged and so on. And we also ship a VCL file for varnish you can use to configure your cache with. So, how does it work? On a very, very high level, it goes like this. So, whenever a request is incoming to the server, uh, Varnish checks it and sees if it can be served from the cache. And if it, if it can be, then Varnish just sends it to the user's browser. And here's where things get interesting. Varnish also do, does it for uh, authenticated users. And how it can do that is because if, if the request isn't, uh, can, can, isn't found in the cache, Varnish, uh, of course, passes the request to Drupal, and Drupal then starts executing the page load. But it does it as an anonymous user, and such generating a response that can be cached by Varnish safely. There's no personalized data in it. And of course, we don't do that for all requests. In some, uh, for, first of all, if, if the uh, page isn't set cacheable, then we don't do anything. And then if, if, if the page can't be seen or executed by an anonymous user, we don't do anything. We don't want the cache to fill up with uh, sensitive data ever. And, and there are also some minor details here. Some, in some cases, we might want to bypass the cache, but those are really not worth going into here. Okay, so then the user's browser has finally received the response. And if, if the user happens to be an anonymous one, we just show the page to the user and be done with it. And if the user happens to be authenticated, we need to generalize personal, uh, generate personalized parts of it in a separate Ajax backend, which we call the get components backend. And then we inject the results on the page. And you might wonder what personalized content actually means in this case. Well, first of all, you can you can uh, enable cache control support for any, any block in Drupal, uh, meaning that uh, all, all blocks you enable it for are uh, tagged as personalized and they will be uh, generated for authenticated users in the get components Ajax backend. And the, we also provide a, an API where you can tag any, any other content than uh, than blocks if you need. And for those who are interested, uh, we actually, in order to uh, be able to generate the personalized content in the Ajax, Ajax backend, we need to store, uh, store the function that's going to be used to generate the content and the function arguments. And then we need the HTML ID, which we use to replace the content in the uh, user's browser. So what benefits does this sort of approach have? Uh, well, first of all, this is, I think this is kind of obvious. Uh, only the needed parts of the page are loaded. We, we avoid some bootstrapping. Actually, we avoid all bootstrapping or almost all bootstrapping for anonymous users. They just get served the page directly from Varnish. And for, for authenticated users, we still need to do bootstrap in the get components backend, but we only generate the uh, parts that are actually needed, so we avoid generating the whole page all over again. And we do this in a single request. All, all, all the personalized parts are executed in, in a single request. And, well, from the user's point of view, one of the 
one of the benefits is that the user instantly gets something to look at while the hard parts of the page are being loaded. So it makes the site just feel faster. Okay, so there's a gap catch to it. First of all, building high performance sites is a complex matter and cache control is not going to solve all your performance problems. And well, if you're only going to remember one thing about this session, let it be this. I'm not presenting a magic bullet here. Uh, uh, why is it a complex matter? It's because that simply if you take varnish in the use, that's not going, probably not going to solve your performance issues, as we will see later. And uh, another catch is that whenever you, you develop a site with cache control, you kind of have to keep in mind that you're working with cache control or you might, you might end up doing a lot of work. And what this means is that you need to think what parts of your site are going to be personalized for the users and what's the performance impact of these parts. And the sad truth is that most likely you will end up writing at least some custom code when you're using cache control. And another sad truth is that you'll probably end up spending some time wondering why the site behaves differently when cache control is ena enabled. And Yes, the, the fact that sites sometimes, the site sometimes be, be, behaves differently is that is due to the fact that, uh, for example, CSS and JavaScript files simply aren't loaded. All of them aren't loaded when an anonymous user makes a request. So you may end up having to load some of the JS and CSS files in, in a uh, hook that cache control provides you. Okay, so you might have heard about edge side includes and you might wonder why you should use cache, cache control instead of ESI. Well, ESI is partial loading technique which is supported by Varnish and also some content delivery networks. And in, in, in ESI, you, you basically you write, write this special markup that gets cached in the varnish and varnish, well, before serving the page from the cache, it, it goes through the ESI markup and loads, loads the ESI marked path, uh, parts of the page from cache or, or from Drupal, usually from Drupal directly. And, well, Cache control has, does have some benefits over ESI. One is that uh, when using ESI, you will have to wait until the whole page is loaded by Varnish before it passes it forward. And while doing it, uh, Varnish causes Drupal to bootstrap several times per page request when generating those uh, parts. And well, to my knowledge, this might change in Drupal 8, so I, I hope we are go heading to better direction with that. And it might, in, if this is the case, it might, might even end up burdening the server with even more bootstraps than it would without any caching. So, onwards to the cases then. First one is jatkoaika.com, which is the lead, uh, leading ice hockey site in Finland. We get mm, about 200,000 unique visitors and 1.6 million page loads per week. And the good thing about this is that almost exclusively the page load are being done by anonymous users. Actually, the only, only users using the site, as all indicated, are the site administrators and we have disabled cache control for those. Uh, cache control allows you to disable it from certain, certain roles. And what makes it even easier, 
content on the site is read a lot more often than it's written. So we don't really have to <coughs> worry about uh, cache purging that much. Okay, here's a screenshot of the site. It basically offers the Finnish hockey fan everything he needs about uh, news from different leagues and, and results and statistics and teams, whatever. So, how we achieve this? We have uh, the basic Drupal MySQL set up. The boosted with solar and memcached and varnish and this all is running on one server. And we have cache control enabled for all content pages, all node pages, taxonomy term pages, the front page, whatever we have. And <coughs> we're using uh, different TTL settings for different pages to uh, control the cache. Uh, uh, freshness. And we're actually using not using any, any custom code. Uh, we still do have some requirements about uh, content propagation to the cache that we need to, uh, the site administrators want to be able to update the site so that the updated content is, can be accessed by the users fast. And for this we, ha we are using low TTLs on, for example, the front page. We're not doing purchase to the front page. It's, it's enough to use like 30 second or one minute TTL on the front page. And because of all this, the server loads are really minimal. We're, we're able to hand pretty much everything the users can throw at us. So this is, this is how things work in a perfect world. We just enable cache control and our site starts working like charm. Unfortunately, this is not the case always. As you, can, as you will see with demi.fi. Uh, demi.fi is the community around the <coughs> Demi magazine, which is really popular amongst Finnish teenage girls. Uh, it's, the site has been around since 1998 or so. And uh, the version we did, it's maybe the fourth incarnation of the site. And we had to do a huge migration for it. And currently the site has like 250,000 registered users, uh, millions of nodes, which include uh, discussion threads, community pages, and blog posts. And uh, well, we get 2.8 million weekly page views. And I can tell you that teenage girls are probably the hardest demographic to please. They, they will really let you know if something's wrong. But the good thing about them is that they always uh, also forget quite fast. <laughs> So, what makes this case hard is that most of the page loads are done by authenticated users. And during the busy hours, we have, might even have 1,500 of those logged in at the same time. And, well, the user base is pretty fanatic. They hit refresh all, at all times. They, they generate a lot of content. They, they write, they start new discussions. A, at an alarming rate, they comment each other discussions at an alar alarming date, rate, and thus they generate a lot of content, and this poses a challenge to how we can keep the cache up to date because they also want to see the content they posted on the site immediately, and even further, every every almost every page on the site has a lot of personalized content that's different for each user. So we might be in some trouble with this one. Okay, this is a screenshot from the site. This one actually features the forum listing, which is 
one of the most requested page of the pages of the site. And on the right hand side you can see some blocks which are personalized for each user. And furthermore the user can users can uh, arrange the discussion uh, topics to their liking and well as I said new discussion threads are being uh, created at all times so this page also gets needs to be refreshed often so I will go to the details a bit later but how we dealt with this is that we actually uh, offloaded all the almost all the theming of the uh, moving parts to the user's browser and we just served uh, JSON feeds from the backend. Okay, a little bit about the setup. Here too we have a Drupal and MySQL setup. We've up the, uh, upgraded the MySQL to use uh, to per corner server for performance reasons. We're using Solar for uh, searches and as a storage. MongoDB as a storage. We have Nginx and PHP FPM and memcached and Varnish and all of this is running on almost one server. It's, it used to be used to run on one server but then we uh, we leverage another a part of an, uh, another server to partly offload the uh, PHP FPM processes to. And well this is something I'm, I'm, I'm a bit proud of that we can we can run this kind of site on one server and well, one and a half servers. And well, how we use cache control here is that we enable it for almost all user-facing pages, at least the ones that are requested the most. Some, uh, for some pages, cache control can't really be used, and uh, web, web form pages are one of these cases where we it's not advised to use cache control because the forms will just fail. And well, since a lot of the users are authenticated and uh, there's a lot of uh, personalized stuff on the page, the Ajax backend, the get, comp get components backend, is it's un under a lot of st stress. And well, also we we have written quite a lot, a lot of custom code to keep the cache uh, fresh so that purchases happen when they should happen. And there are also some quite a lot of JavaScript and CSS, CSS tweaking needed to make the site look good when used with cache control. Uh, this is actually one case where, where cache tagging would, would benefit us a, a lot. And after all this, the server loads are still significant, but they are mostly within tolerable, tolerable levels. We get, do get some, some rush hours where, where the loads go up a bit. And we're still, still kind of, it. this is work in progress, we're still kind of uh, struggling to push the loads even, even lower so that we can, we can just leave the server never never look at it again well not really but and okay a little bit a little bit about the strategy we we approach this kind of monster with uh, we want to avoid triple bootstrap and theming as much as we can well luckily this is what cache control does it tries to keep keep as much content into varnished cache as possible and well, as an as an example, that using cache control isn't the only thing you can do, or it's uh, using cache control as 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 self isn't usually enough. Uh, we've we have these fast JSON-based backends for data that changes often, like the forum topic listings I was talking about, and we 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 distribute the content as json and let users browsers handle the theming and we've created a little 
little module called Front Thiever to do help with this. And we also used cache control for those Ajax backends. So we, we cached those results with very short TTL, 30 seconds or so. So we don't we don't purge those actually. But 30 seconds seems to be uh, short enough time period so that nobody really notices it. And yes, further, we, we use fast storage. So we use Solar for views, MongoDB for field storage, and Memcached for cache, Drupal cache backend. And well, as, as most Drupal developers probably aren't that comfortable with, with fiddling with Varnish or, or optimizing database engines and, and stuff like this, my professional advice would be to get a good sysadmin admin in your team that can do these things for you. So we, we have learned quite a lot of lesson, lessons in this project. One of them being that the get components back end really needs to be fast. And this caused us to actually rewrite the whole thing using to use MongoDB as a storage backend. When 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 the module was using MySQL as a backend, the server loads skyrocketed in some cases. But now th when we got that under control we noticed that cache controls front, front end also needs to be fast. There's a lot of, lot of JavaScript magic going on in the front end. And, and, and since there are a lot of, lot of mobile devices in the market these days, it needs to be pretty fast. And also, cache purging can, can itself become a performance issue, meaning that uh, the users generate so much content that the varnish varnish kind of kind of doesn't take well to the amount of purge requests it gets, and we solved overcame this by uh, using using uh, uh, purges instead of bans in in varnish 3.0 terminology. Uh, because uh, in Varnish 3.0, bands bands are implemented using regular expressions, and if we have a uh, extensive list of bands, it will take some time for Varnish to go through all of the entries in the band list to see if the incoming request match matches any of those. So we switch to purge in, instead, which which just searches the entry in the cache and deletes it. And well, just 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 an example of how 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 performance issues kind of when you solve one you you run into another one. After we have done all this, we we noticed that uh, memcached actually started to uh, show some worrying symptoms with uh, with the way it handled form cache. Our form uh, form cache. Uh, size went up to 10, 10 gigs or something like that, causing, causing memcached to lose some of the cache entries uh, because it just ran out of space allocated to it. So we had to, after trying uh, different options, we had to move the whole, whole form cache to MySQL, which in turn causes, caused MySQL loads to go up. So. There's really no silver bullet here. It's it's all, there's always something to we, to tweak in these high traffic environments. And yeah, well, if we didn't know it earlier, we do know it now that building high performance sites is hard, hard, and it it gets harder if you don't take performance into account from the very beginning. And from the by the very beginning, I mean the design phase also. You need to work with the designers to, to kind of have a plan uh, which, which uh, 
uh, what, what is the performance cost of different, different options. Uh, of, for example, showing a certain piece of content on a page, a certain listing, and uh, showing personalized content, giving the users a lot of options. All of this makes caching harder and, well, it probably makes the users happier, but not the developers. And uh, it's, it's best to mitigate potential performance killers at this point if you, if you, can, if you can avoid some per, uh, obvious performance trouble with just, uh, just uh, influencing the design phase, then you might self, you save yourself a lot of trouble later in the project. And, well, another lesson is that cache control is <laughs> pretty much far from perfect and it doesn't alone solve the problems, as I hope I have stressed enough in this session. And actually, you may end up doing a lot of work ironing, ironing out small glitches with cache purging. You, you might get some user feedback yet. Yeah, yeah I, I made some changes to the site and the, it, they don't show yet. And things like this, you might actually end up using quite a lot of debugging time with those. So that's the hard case. Then we go to the different one, which is Tecla Campus. It's an uh, online learning tool and a community for engineering construction students where they can learn how to use the tools, uh, structural engineering tools, Tecla. Tecla uh, provides. And here are challenges that the users, there are not, not that many users, but they, they come from all over the world. And almost all of them are authenticated. There's a moderate amount of personalized content per page for logged in users, not that bad. And they don't really generate that much of content of their own. There's a support forum on the site, but it's not, nothing like the forum the teenage girls use. So again, a screenshot of, of the site. This one is very simple. Basically, it has lessons for, to use the tools. Okay, so how did we approach, approach this problem? Well, the site is hosted in Finland, but the user base, base is spread all over the world. And we wanted to mitigate the latency to, to users in, for example, Asia and Australia and all these remote locations. So we figured we need some sort of content delivery network. And, well, we tried out a few until it turned out that the fast lie CDN actually uses Varnish as, as its backend. So we decided to give it a go. And it, it turns out that cache control actually plays pretty nicely with fast lie. Uh, pretty much everything works straight out of the box, even cache purges. And if you are having some trouble with, with fast lie, they even allow you to upload your own VCL configuration file so you can you can affect the way how the Anish actually works. Okay, this it's all seems very happy almost as the first case, but it's not not equally happy because we still needed some custom code due to the fact that some some users uh, a lot of the users are authenticated and 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 they see a lot of uh, some personalized content. So I'm going to quickly cover all of the topics again. Uh, so cache control is a module for integrating your site with an ex external HTTP cache. I've been talking about Varnish, but you could really uh, try it with any HTTP cache. And it works for both anonymous and authenticated users. 
and the fact that it does work with authenticated users is the is the justification for its existence. And how it integrates your site with an uh, HTTP cache is that it manipulates the cache control headers in the uh, HTTP responses sent out by Drupal. And how it, how it does it for authenticated users, it simply tags some, of the, uh, parts of, some parts of the page as personalized and those parts are uh, executed in an Ajax backend at a later time. It can help your site to be a lot faster than just vanilla Drupal. And it can be easy or hard depending on the complexity of your site. And I wish I was presenting you uh, like this bulletproof solution that always makes your site blazingly fla fast, but that's not what I'm doing here, unfortunately. Uh, uh, well, what we mean by an easy case is that we have mostly anonymous users, uh, really high read-write ratio, meaning that there are a lot of content reads compared to content writes. Uh, there are few, only few purges needed. And the hard case is that we, we need to serve a, a big number of authenticated users that generate a lot of content. And we also saw that cache control can help you achieve geographical distribution on your site. And at this point I would like to invite you to discuss, ask questions if you have anything. Yes. Uh, the question was about uh, Ajax, re Ajax requests and how we cache those, or do we do it at all? The answer is that you can use cache, cache control to cache Ajax, requ Ajax requests if you want. Uh, you just have to make sure that they are, you, you can't really do that if, if the Ajax, Ajax request serves something that's only meant for a single user, for an authenticated user, but for for anonymous users or Ajax requests that do do a, do, this, do the same thing for each user, you can you can do that as as we have done in the demi.fi case. We we cache cache the Ajax re, Ajax request that serves the uh, JSON output for the form listings. Thank you. Great presentation. Thanks a lot. Um, do you deal with out-of-band issues, like multiple varnish servers? And um, because one of the things that we've sort of noticed uh, in, in dealing with any sort of um, HTTP uh, proxy cache is that we usually have multiple varnish servers, and at the same time, when our users are uh, essentially have are invalidating or purging content, whether we're using ban or purge, it still takes a while for that to act that request to actually happen. So, we started doing it in the actual thread, and then we moved it to you know a sort of spawned off a new thread, and then we moved it to QAPI and sort of you know did that because we had to clear out a bunch of Varnish servers. Have you sort of addressed any of that or come across any of it? Because we're sort of, we still don't know what the best solution is. Well, this is actually actually a point where I would really like to have our sysadmin here to answer you, but uh, cache control does support multiple Varnish servers. It, if uh, in case of purchase, it sends out the purge request to each one of those 
and it can be configured to do it in a non-blocking way, where yeah. you su just send out the purge request and they and back. just continue executing. And it's kind of let's hope it it gets done before the user loads the page the next time. But as as how to do that? Uh, what what are the implications of the varnish side? I I would really have to consult our sysadmin for that. Well, thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Yeah. Do you mean the, uh, our own NGINX backend? Yes. Uh, <coughs> yeah, the question was that if, if we can cache the results sent out by the get components backend, the, the backend that cache control uses. And in short, the answer is no. We, we used to have, uh, in a previous version of cache control, uh, we, we tried this approach where where you could actually do that if the page has uh, components, only components that, uh, let's see how, how it went, that don't need to be uh, generated for the user during each page request, such as, let's say, the box in the upper right corner of the of your site that says welcome username that's that's an example of of a block that really doesn't need to be generated over and over again but it kind of made the back end a bit more complex than it should be and that was one of the reasons one of the reasons to the performance problems we had and we decided to simplify it and now we just don't the the uh, HX re uh, backend responses are not cacheable. Yeah. You mentioned that, that you use uh, mempage, both mempagd and mobile mongodb. Uh, why is that? For example, in, in this uh, get component function, uh, why do you use uh, you know, mongodb instead of mempage? Uh, we use mongodb because we want to have a uh, non volatile. Uh, storage, which memcached isn't. We we need to be uh, sure that when we when we tag some some parts of the page as personalized, that they will we will find find the content we inserted at a, at a later time. And with memcached, you don't really have that currency. Okay, so that's the pur purpose. Actually, the same purpose for the form cache. Uh, sorry? Uh, this is the same as, as the form cache. You use MongoDB for that? Uh, we don't use MongoDB for form cache. We, we used to use, in this, this hard case, we used to use it. Uh, memcached for it. And, well, as it turns out, wasn't really a good idea because memcached ran out of space and we st it's still a kind of standing problem with the site that we don't really, we haven't found the optimal caching solution for the form cache with big volumes. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, did you do some tests to measure, measure the speed gain you get from using cache control? Uh, did we do some tests to measure the speed gains? Uh, Yes, we have done some tests. I wish I had you have some figures with me to to show. But uh, let's say in, in a happy case where you uh, where you have a lot of authentic, uh, anonymous users and the content can be served directly from the cache, you can get to several hundreds or thousands of requests per second, whereas with 
with any other Drupal you can get to, I don't know, tens or maybe hundreds in an optimal case. So we are talking about several several orders of magnitude here. At the best case, in the in the worst cases, it's not that significant. Yeah. Yeah, the question was about configuring cache control uh, and disabling it per need. Uh, there's a global switch in cache control that allows you to just just disable the whole whole thing from your site if if you do if you're doing development or if 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 it's somehow malfunctioning or f for whatever reason. And you can also configure per per path uh, per menu route or path which which ones are cacheable and with with which. Uh, TTL and for nodes you can also uh, enable or disable you disable caching by node type for example you usually want to disable uh, caching from web form nodes and maybe keep it enabled for other ones yeah question about varnish did you have to play uh, a lot with the VCL file or did you use uh, did we have to play with the VCL file a lot? Uh, we had the cache, cache control requires it, its own VCL file to work perfectly because we use some some special cookies to to denote whether the user is authenticated or if the cache control has been disabled for a user, and we do not we do not grant any any permissions to users based on these cookies, we just use them as flags to let cache control know what to do. So we, yeah, we do need some custom VCL and we had, have uh, had to uh, make some iterations to it, but I think it's pretty much stable now. I'm not seeing so many people reaching for the mic, so I guess we're done here if if anyone anybody doesn't have anything. Okay, thank you.